Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. All right, Nathan Killen, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, buddy. Uh, glad to be here and uh, just... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm glad to have you back on the podcast, Nathan. It's been it's been a while and I mean, we did one last year uh when it was I think it was me, you and Andy May, but it was just a Spartan Forge thing that we had transferred over, but you and I hadn't done one together in I think almost 4 years. Yeah, it's been a while. Yep. Yeah, no, I was, I've been, uh, been looking forward to, to getting to talk to you there, but I guess, first of all, before we start talking too much deer hunting, are you getting, are you getting back into the swing of things? I know you're still hunting, but like, uh, you know, back to the normal schedule and work and everything else. Yeah. Uh, you know, I took a couple of weeks of vacation there and, uh, I spent most of it in Iowa and, uh, and then got back and hunted a few days here in Virginia and being off two weeks from work, man, it really sucks whenever you have to go back to, you know, back to a grind, just like yeah. everybody else. But uh, it's what pays the bills and uh, buys hunting gear and everything else we enjoy. So, <laughs> yeah, did uh, <laughs> um, work. So do you're if I remember, are you on a swing shift? Is that how, what your work schedule is like? Or do you work nights? Uh, I used to be up until just a few months ago. I actually uh, got my old position back. I still work for the same company, same place. But I was on a swing shift. I didn't care much for the night shift. And uh, but the days off were fantastic. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just needed, uh, you know, I'm getting older and that uh, night shift just doesn't agree with me very well. So. I'm working four tens now and I like it awful well. So that gives me Friday, Saturday and Sunday off. And, uh, so, yep. I really like that. It oh, works man. out good for hunting. Yep. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good schedule. Um, uh, the, four, the four tens. Yep. Nice. I know, um, I'm still, I'm still as at the time of recording this still in the kind of the grind, uh, portion of the, the hunting season. And I'm starting to see everything else around me fall apart. Like in the middle, middle of the night, I have this, I have a coal stove in my basement and that's how I heat my basement and the floors of my house. Well, I hadn't really, uh, been prepared, uh, for the, for the winter to come so quick. And one, I didn't get coal ordered and delivered. And two, I knew how to fix the stove pipe because it was starting to rot up there. It was galvanized. I needed to put a stainless one up and, and, uh, but I've been just neglecting it, acting like it's not there, you know, that kind of deal. <laughs> well, last night we got some wind and, uh, heard what sounded like an explosion and you know i didn't know what happened walked around my house everything was fine and this morning i get up to go hunting and i walk out i like these these doors that swing open out of my basement coming up out of the ground there and, and all this stuff falls off and my stove pipes laying on the ground <laughs> it blew oh. it blew off and hit i was like man i was like this is just this st kind of stuff starts to happen towards the end of hunting season because it's things that I've neglected taking care of. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so I, I, I got, I got a big, uh, to do list here once if, you know, one, once I can, or if I can, you know, eventually shoot a buck here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Those to, uh, uh, honey do list can pile up on a man. And my wifey, you know, I want to keep her happy. So I make sure that I take care of everything like that before season comes in. Because if I don't, my hunt time gets cut short. So we don't want that. No, no, it was funny. Um, so my, my girlfriend doesn't uh, live around here, but she, she's in town right now. And, and uh, she came back and she saw some of the, you know, things that I've let go a little bit. And yeah you know, wasn't extremely happy. And she also gave me a list of like things like, Hey, you know, you go out and you're getting this, this meat that you're you know so proud of. I want you to come up with two recipes to cook for me of, uh, you know, different meals. And I want you to like, really think about it, you know, just throwing steaks, tater tots and vegetables every night. Like that's not going to fly. So, you know, she's like, we, I want you to come up with some different things. And I'm like, all right, yeah, I gotta, <laughs> I, 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 these are things I should have thought of before hunting season, uh, and worked on, but here I am. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah. But anyways, I, uh, Nathan, I, I, I've been 
wanting to have you on the podcast in general, but we had a, a, a pretty good reason to to uh, just make it happen here recently um, as you killed an absolute giant buck in Virginia. So congratulations on that first and foremost. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. That, that was a, a pretty much uh, 42 years or seasons in the making. Um, you know, we all want to kill big deer and, but I've always wanted to kill one of the absolute top end deer for the state, you know, something, you know, in the one or two percent, you know, percentile range. And, and for here, you know, that's always been 150 or better. I've gotten close in the past and, uh, but that's just a 150 inch buck. Uh, and, and you know, inches doesn't mean anything, you know, but, uh, I just feel like it, it really represents, um, the top end, uh, mountain whitetail, you know? And, uh, so, over the past few years that's kind of what i've been striving to do is is find that kind of or caliber of a buck to hunt and i've i've been able to find those kind of deer it's taken a lot of work but uh and this year um i was able to accomplish that goal and uh with actually about 20 inches to spare so (laughs) i know i yeah that and and you know it's funny and you have the the rack in the background there but it it I can't wait to see it in person because looking at it, the one thing that, you know, even measurements don't account for is the mass on the tines. Like yeah. that, if you, if you did the, whatever type of measurement scale where you, you know, put it in water, the water yep. disbursement, like yep. I feel like that, that would score extremely high because it yeah. just carries it out from the beams all the way up the tines. I've, I've, I don't know if I've ever seen a deer like that completely all the way through. Yeah, yeah, it, it's very uh, unusual, uh, even you know, for a lot of places, but especially here in Virginia. You know, a lot of people that look at it, they say, "Where did you get this?" Uh, you know, they think Canada, and yeah. I'm like, "No, right here in Southwest Virginia." So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it just shows you know that uh, what age can do uh, for the right buck. You know, not all of them are capable of doing that, but you get just the right buck uh, that reaches you know, the right age and, and that's what they look like. So. Yeah. And, and what, what, uh, how old do you think that deer was? I think he was only five and a half. Really? Yes. Um, and, and the reason is I, I that, that's what he looks like to me. I've got a couple of years of history with him. Um, and after I killed him, uh, some other guys came forward and said that they had been hunting him for about three years. And just based on what he jumped from last year, you know, I, I think that he's five. He he could be six, but I would be surprised if he was. And to be honest with you, our bucks, uh, I've noticed here in the mountains, generally don't top out till they're between the six and eight year old uh, range. So he technically he could have put on, you know, uh, several more inches over the next couple of years, you know, so. Why do you hey. wait, Nathan? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. that, but that's that's amazing. I mean, that it's the same way here in Pennsylvania and the areas I hunt. Like, I feel like they, yeah, they can go. I mean, that buck my dad shot a few years ago. I can't remember if he was seven or eight, uh, but he was at the biggest that he ever was at that time. And I've seen it. And it seems like after that, they start to, you know, go down downhill and sometimes pretty fast as far as from an, uh, an inches standpoint, but that is, that is impressive. I mean, I, I, I would have thought that that deer was older just from the, the rack itself. You know, honestly, I don't know if I even looked at the pictures of the body because I was just kind of focused on <laughs> the rack yeah. of him. Yeah. He, he's, uh, you know, he, he's in the five to six year old range, but I really think that he's just five. I'm going to have him aged and uh and see what he is i'm gonna do both tooth wear and the uh where you send off the front uh teeth i think it's called uh sen sen senium uh yes senum annuli or something yeah something like that so i'm gonna uh, do both and uh and you know see what he turns up there but i I feel like he's gonna be five yeah Oh, that's, that's awesome. And, and so you said that you knew about him for three years, uh, two years, yeah. two years. Okay. Uh, 
it's kind of unique where this deer lived, uh, which is part of why I think that he, he, you know, which really and truly, I don't see five year old as being that old of a deer. I think that it's kind of the entryway into the uh, mature uh, side, but uh, <clears throat> he he lived in a spot that uh, most people that if they were coming in there hunting, they would walk right past him. And actually, I did, you know, for a few seasons. And um, but yeah, yeah, he lived very, very close to a hardtop road. Mm, okay, that okay. So that's that's why you're saying that you think people would walk past him just because he yeah yeah just because the uh, you know most uh, hardcore hunters in my area and and most everywhere else you know the first thing they do when they're looking at. Uh, topo or uh, when they get out of the vehicle they're going to go as far as they can go and you know usually that's a minimum of one mile Mm -hmm. and uh, around here that could be two or three miles uh, or or more you know just depending on where they're at but uh, this deer at no time uh, that I have evidence of uh, was he ever more than a half a mile from hardtop road and he actually paralleled it and I don't mind to talk about this now that he's dead, yeah. you know, but, um, <clears throat> he, part of, part of his home range actually extended over onto some, uh, private land. And, uh, but the, the majority of it was on uh, national forest, which is where I was hunting, you know, Yeah. but, um, I had been hunting this area for several years and, um, uh, I actually, I think the first time that I actually found evidence of him, which is, and it could have been another deer actually. Uh, so that there might've been another deer in there before him, but it's been probably three years ago. I was in there shed hunting and, uh, on my way back to the truck, I just, uh, took a different route than I would normally take. And I was, I was very close to the truck and I started seeing some pretty impressive sign that made me feel like that, uh, there must be a good deer there. So that was, I think that was in 2021 and then 2022, um, I was hunting uh, deeper back in this area and, um, on my way back to the truck that this was probably early black powder, uh, season, which would have been early November. I decided to walk through that area and. I come upon some uh, more good sized rubs in that area. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to put out a camera right here and just see what it is. And I did. And I, whenever I come back and check the camera, which was around the end of November, I was I was shocked at what I had. And it was, of course, him. And at that time, you know, he was 160 inch deer. And um, so I hunted him the rest of that season, which, you know, it wasn't very much because by then I didn't have any more vacation left and I was just basically hunting, uh, uh, weekends. So, uh, I didn't have that much time to hunt him. So season came and went, I didn't see him, uh, but I was getting, uh, pictures of him. And, uh, once season, uh, went out, I kept rolling my trail cameras and I, I run them on, uh, a video mode mostly and on scrapes. <clears throat> so, when season went out, I could just kept my uh, cameras running and uh, I waited for him to shed. And uh, once he did, then I, I spent a lot of time uh, looking for his antlers. Matter of fact, I had uh, right around 60 miles in before I found uh, that first one, which that's the only one I found was that, just that one. But uh, and it was right where I expected it to be. Matter of fact, I had walked by that antler. Uh, on two or three occasions, <laughs> but just, but I was, you know, the, it was a really big antler. I was expecting it to be, you know, laying either. If I knew if it was tines up, it would be easy to spot. If it was tines down, it should be easy to spot too, because the way his main beams curve, you know, you, you should see that, uh, um, you know, the curve of the curvature of the beam, you know, gets the force floor, but just so happened the, uh, the the points are so heavy on it that it actually laid flat so it was really hard to see but oh. i had walked by it several times and um uh but anyway i thought that antler has to be in this one area or i felt like it and i thought i'm gonna make one more swap through there and i did and sure sure enough there it was and uh 
<clears throat> so, but, but during the time that I was looking for his sheds, you know, I was, I was looking closely at all the rubs that I had found and also running my cameras on uh, video mode. I was able to identify his uh, droppings from all the other deer in the area uh, because I watched him use the bathroom in that in uh, that one scrape. And, and whenever I seen that, I went immediately to that pile of droppings. And, and sure enough, it was uh, very distinct. So while I'm in there shed hunting, I'm, I'm looking at the droppings. I'm looking at the uh, rubs and stuff. And I was able to identify and put together uh, pretty much where he was and where he wasn't. And, uh, so once uh, <clears throat> spring green up come, you know, uh, I pretty much uh, was done scouting him. And then this summer I started running uh, my cameras again, trying to, you know, just pretty much verify that he was still alive and uh, what he looked like. And uh, I started out with uh, my cameras on uh, scrapes <clears throat> because, I, you know, we all know that now that, you know, they like to use scrapes year round, not necessarily the ground, but, you know, the licking branch. But I didn't pick him up until uh, I actually checked the camera. I think it was end of June, first of July, somewhere through there, and he he wasn't on the scrape. And I always called it his favorite scrape because that's the one he was, uh, you know, using a whole lot during uh, November, uh, December, and even up into January. And um, so I, I moved the camera to a trail. It was a side hill trail that was above that scrape that uh, I found a lot of his rubs and stuff on. And I left the camera there for, I don't know, about three or four weeks and went back and checked it. And I got uh, video of, of him. And man, he he was just enormous. You know, where he was in velvet, you could tell that he was going to be, you know, close to a Boone and Crockett animal. And uh, so... I, you know, I, my obsession started, you know, <laughs> pretty much with that. And, uh, well, so I, 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 I just, well, go ahead. So, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I wanted to ask you a few things there. But I remember, I believe this, you had sent me trail camera picture, or the video of him when you picked him up. And I remember my jaw just dropped and I was like, and I think last year too, if I, if I remember right, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is just an in, in absolute incredible deer but the the other thing that i wanted to ask based on what you were saying with the sheds uh or his shed that you'd found and everything did you find that that deer kind of had like w a, an area that that he spent most of his time or was he kind of a roamer or did he seem like he had like a he was very territorial no no he he, he pretty much stuck to uh one area and, and whenever i say one area this area was probably a half a mile wide and maybe three quarters of a mile long. Okay. And uh, so, you know, that that's, that's roughly half of what uh, most bucks uh, um, use, you know, at, at least on the minimum size, you know, a lot of bucks that I've hunted have used, you know, four square miles or so. Yeah. And, and those, those deer are really tough to, uh, to get up with. So, this deer, I, I didn't feel like, I felt like if I spent my time within uh, his core area, uh, that eventually I was going to at least see him, you know. And, uh, but I, <clears throat> the, the area is really thick. Uh, a lot of rhododendron and uh, mountain laurel. Uh, there is some open areas in it. Um, and it's, it's, it's smaller topography too. And I think that smaller topography is one thing uh, that has uh, that contributed to to his home range being smaller, and and that's actually one thing that I'm going to start looking for is smaller topography. Uh, uh, whenever I'm I'm looking for individual bucks to hunt, because I think the smaller the topography, uh, in other words, the tighter the ridges and stuff, uh, those bucks may their home uh, or core areas might actually be smaller. Whereas areas that has really large uh, topography, those bucks uh, I'm finding now are t tend to be more the roamer type bucks. And uh, so, but anyway, I think that's what contributed to him, you know, having a smaller core area, plus him living along the side of a, uh, a hard top road. And uh, because he was basically parallel in that hard top road. And, um, 
Now, there's a trail that actually uh, split his uh, core area or home range basically in half. And, uh, and, and it started at the parking lot that, uh, I parked at and, and went straight back, uh, toward the mountain. And so half his home range was on one side of it and half of his home range was on the other side, which also incorporated the, uh, private land. <clears throat> but now, um, uh, I had cameras, uh, staged in, in both halves of his, uh, home range. And, uh, my plan was is to hunt him during bow season and uh but try not to uh, put too much pressure on him you know and i was actually hoping to catch him around that scrape that i uh, would kept getting him on i never did get him on the scrape during daylight hours but i got him in the area during daylight hours yeah. and uh and he seemed to prefer to move uh on days with some precipitation so uh on days that i had precipitation uh, i hunted the scrape and uh, but I never did catch him on it. And uh, actually, I, ne- I had never seen the deer during uh, a period uh, other than trail camera pictures till the, the morning that I killed him. And um, but I left for Iowa. Uh, I see. It was November the 4th, I think. And uh, went out and hunted out there for almost two weeks. And. I was wanting to be back for our rifle season opener because I was afraid that, you know, somebody might be in there hunting him. So, you know, I needed to be there, Yeah, you know, and plus I wanted to be able to take uh, advantage of any uh, um, hunting pressure that might be on the uh, private land. And the area that I knew that I needed to be in, I couldn't actually bow hunt because uh, it was in a hollow, a really thick hollow. And, um, uh, the, the, the winds was just swirly down there. I, I put a trail camera down there, but I hadn't even went and checked it yet. So I didn't know if he was going to be on it yet, but I, I really need to back up just a little bit. Uh, th- this deer actually didn't use his whole, uh, home range this, this year. He had basically reduced it to just half. So his core area this year, home range had you know, was half of what it was last year, which helped too. And, um, and I think that it had a lot to do with the acorns, uh, that we had a good acorn crop, uh, this year in certain areas. Some areas didn't have uh, such good acorn crop, but the main part of his core area had really good acorn crop. So he had no reason to leave there. He had, you know, plenty of does and stuff like that. So, uh, now fast forward to, uh, uh, coming into rifle season, uh, you know, I'm a traditional bow hunter. I, I would have loved to have killed him with a, uh, a bow, but a deer of this caliber, I was going to hunt him with whatever, uh, legal means I yeah. had available, you know, and, uh, and I love to rifle hunt anyway, you know, uh, there's just something, uh, uh, classic about carrying a rifle in, uh, in the mountains, you know, but anyway, um, uh, opening morning of uh, gun season, uh, I decided I was going to hunt down in that spot that I had uh, found while I was shed hunting that I, I knew that I needed to be in. And because I, I felt like it was really centrally located, if there was any pressure on the private land coming in, I felt like that he was, he would, it was a good chance that he was going to come through there. And plus he could, it was kind of like a thermal hub down in there too. He could scent check for does down in there and it was thick on both sides. So I decided I was going to hunt that opening morning of uh, gun season. And my plan was uh, because I didn't have a tree picked out because it's so thick and I wanted to pick just the perfect spot to where I, I would have the maximum amount of advantage to be able to see down into the thick stuff, plus have uh, the wind right too. So I, I, I waited up on top of the ridge till it started getting daylight. And then I started slowly slipping down into where I needed to be. And uh, I got down in there and uh, I, I spotted a tree that I needed to be in. So I was standing at the bottom of my tree and I had my, uh, one of my Timber Ninja sticks in my hand. And I had just put it against the tree and had my rope in my left hand. And I heard something down in that uh, thermal hub. And I couldn't see down there because it was so thick. And uh, so I just stopped and uh, my gun was behind me and 
and then I heard a grunt, or at least I thought it was a grunt, because uh, it was windy uh, that morning. It had rained that night, and uh, uh, so th- uh, there was no wind where I was at, but the top, you know, the top of the ridge was uh, pretty windy. So I just kept standing there, and then I, I for sure heard another grunt, and I could tell by the grunts uh, that he was coming over to my side of the hollow. And uh, then I heard him snort wheeze, and I'm like, well, uh, you know, I, I knew then it was definitely a buck, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I, I got my gun at that point, and he was actually across the little hollow on uh, the next little ridge out from me, but on the same hillside that I was on. And uh, so I, I put my gun uh, against a tree looking over in that direction, and I just so happened to catch a glimpse of the back end of a deer go through just a little opening over there. And uh, uh, so I, I put my uh, scope on that opening. And I thought, Lord, please let that be the, the uh, dream catcher. That's what I named him was dream catcher. And, uh, and then he, he wasn't behind that. He had stopped behind that laurel bush and I couldn't see him. And then he had turned around and started walking back down the direction that he had came. And I seen that huge frame, uh, you know, that huge rack come through that opening and I was like, Oh my gosh, it's him, you know? And, uh, so he was, he was actually walking back down in toward that thermal hub. And, uh, and I shot him walking. He was about 60, 70 yards, something like that. And he immediately disappeared out of view. And, uh, so I made my way over there and, and there he was. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you know how, you know how bad that would, or well, not how bad, but, it could it could have worked out, but if you were like two sticks up or like you were in the middle yeah. of climbing, like that worked out exactly how as as good as it could have, obviously. But yeah, you know that that's always yeah. that's always my fear because you know actually this year I spent quite a bit of time of not climbing in the dark. I might get into a spot and sit there and find the tree because I, I was hunting um, a particular deer for a while and it was just. I didn't, I knew the area really well, but I kept having to adjust on, you know, and I didn't have 30 trees picked out. So it was just kind of figuring out what the wind was doing at that spot, how the thermals were interacting and just like trying to find the the place I needed to be in, you know, from day to day, I might move a tree over, but it was just like, I was trying to fine tune it. And I always had that fear of, as I'm going to be climbing up, like, is something going to happen <laughs> to, to where, you know, my bow's on my backpack or, or whatever. And I wasn't able to do it, but that's, that's crazy how, how that ended up working out that way. Oh yeah. And, and you know, as far as I know, he was the only deer there. And a lot of guys uh, asked me, well, wh- why do you think that he snort wheezed? And, and originally, I thought that maybe he heard me easing down in there and may have thought that I was a, a, another deer or another buck. But the more that I get to thinking about it, because he he was down in that thermal hub, or at least on the other side of the uh, hollow, and he made his way up in there grunting, and then he, he snort wheezed, and then he started returning. And this is what I think uh, happened because th- th- this was uh, pretty much peak rut for us, and uh, I think he was locked down with a doe, and there was another buck on the same hillside with me, and he, he went to go push him off, and then he was retreating to his doe whenever I killed him. And I, uh, I believe that that's what happened. And see, it rained the night before, so and it's so thick in there that I would have not seen the other deer uh, leave the area whenever I shot, you know, so... Ah, that makes sense. And, yeah. and, and, uh, you know, it's funny when you, it's rarely do you get to really see them when they're locked down with a doe, at least in most of the areas that I hunt it sounds like, like, you know, where you're at, it's so thick. You, you don't normally get to interact and see that but when I was in West Virginia hunting the, the coal mines, it was like, I could see that. And like the, the buck that I ended up shooting down there was locked on a doe. And that was before I killed him, I was actually on him one other time that morning and I was within 25 yards, but he was in this little thicket and he just kept, he'd ran off another buck that came in. I mean, just charged at him and then came right back and made some, you know, incredible vocalizations and different types of grunts and clicking noises and everything. And would just like circle and then lay down with her. And anytime anything was, 
was uh, another buck would come into the area or whatever he was you know protecting that spot but wouldn't go too far you know just would like poke yeah. in and out in different directions and then and come back and lay down and and that was something that i i don't get to see much you know hunting in in the in the big woods because it's just like it's so thick all the time you can't necessarily have eyes on them when they're locked down like that yeah yeah no yeah, that's that's super interesting and and you know that that so you're saying like that that's peak rut what date was that for for you uh that was the 18th uh so you know our peak is normally around you know 15th 16th somewhere through there uh so that you know that makes sense that he would have been locked down with a doe Mm -hmm. and uh so i'm pretty sure that that's the scenario that played out so yeah and (laughs) what did when you were in there, you know, you were said you were worried a little bit about other hunting pressure. Was there, was there ended up, ended up being anybody close that, you know, like nearby in, in that day? Uh, no, just my dad. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. Uh, he was about 500 yards, uh, above me. Um, I had invited him, uh, to hunt that deer with me. And, um, so, you know, he, he could have been the one that killed it, you know, yeah. and that would have been fine with me. Uh, but uh, I wanted one of us to get him, but, you know, I was, I put a lot of work into this deer and, uh, so, you know, it, it really worked out good. So I feel really blessed to be able to kill him, you know? Yeah, no, definitely did. So did that deer, you know, saying that you think he was kind of the only one that had that, you know, that core area, that home range, because like where, where you hunt is pretty low deer density. So there's not... It's not like you got, you know, a whole bachelor group of bucks that are hanging out in some of these areas. It sounds like they're, you know, spread out, um, a a decent amount, but do you, what did his sign look like as far as did he lay down a lot of sign? Was he territorial in that respect? Cause you were saying that you had found some big rubs and scrape, but was what, what did that kind of look like? Yeah, he, he, uh, he laid down quite a bit of sign, um, not not as much as I have seen, but, you know, a lot of the uh, bucks that I've hunted uh, didn't leave any sign. So, you know, he, he did leave sign, and uh, that was uh, uh, part of how I put together, you know, where he was using and stuff like that. But the main thing that I keyed in on was that one specific scrape. Um, last year, uh, in uh, through November and December and January, while he still had his rack, I was moving uh, cameras around to different places uh, while I still was running that one camera on that scrape that I was getting him on uh, really consistently. I mean, he was there. uh, Every time I went to go check the scrape, I had several videos of him coming back to that scrape. And and with me running it on video, I was also able to identify where he was coming from and going to. And uh, that helped me actually figure out the other half of his uh, home range which is where I found the shed. And um, so okay. you, you can learn so much uh, by running your cameras on video. You know, uh, just one single picture doesn't tell you very much. Yeah. No, I I, I definitely agree with that. And, and you know, I think back to this deer that I was hunting the last few years that's now dead. But, like, one thing I learned about him was – when when it was rut time he was very vocal like his his grunt was very distinguishable and he liked to grunt and and like on video mode you could hear it and yeah and it was very you know and looking back at that deer my dad killed a few years ago that was the same thing i mean before he shot that deer that morning because he already had two encounters with him on the ground he had he heard that deer's grunt and he and he heard it that morning and was like that's I know what deer that is because it was very <laughs> distinguishable, but you know, you learn, you can learn a lot of that from the vid from video, you know, even with the, yeah. the sound and then just like their behaviors and understanding yeah. kind of how they're, how they're moving versus, you know, just seeing it on as, as a, as a static photo, you know I mean? I run, I run all my cameras other than my cell cameras. I keep them on photos just because I'm trying to conserve battery, um, that's kind of the the most the, the reason why I do that. But any of my standard cameras I run on video, and uh, 
I, I love it. I hate going through all the SD cards and like, and trying to categorize it and save this stuff because it's bigger files and it takes longer, but, uh, yeah. it's, you, you learn so much from that. Yeah. You learn their personality, you know, uh, that there was, uh, two or three other bucks that was, uh, coming to his scrape, uh, and I had uh, actually video of him interacting with those bucks uh, in there. And and those other bucks had, you could tell that they had a huge amount of respect for this deer. And uh, um, so, you know, you could tell that he he was definitely the man in the area. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And that scrape, and you may have said it at the beginning, but I, I, I might be getting a couple of them confused here, but that scrape, was that the one that you were saying was like in that hub or was that a different scrape? No, no, th- this scrape, uh, the, the, the wild part about it is was like 250 yards from where I was parking my truck. I mean, this deer was <laughs> close. Matter of fact, I hung one camera because I I was still trying to piece together exactly where uh, he, how he was moving through the area, and I put a camera uh, on a uh, a tree within thirty yards of, of the hardtop road, and uh, I, I I got daylight activity of him there. And uh, but if if you seen where I put it, and I, I, you would understand why he was doing what he was doing, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and, and he had an extreme amount of cover there. I mean, the whole area is just thick, you know, so it wasn't like he was visible, you know, and, and, but, uh, yeah, he, he, uh, he felt very comfortable there and, uh, moved during the daylight some, you know, uh, w- within the week prior to whenever I killed him. So, yeah, and I love the photos with the big rhododendron in the background. I mean, that, I feel like you, that just perfectly captures because I know like your area of the mountains has, and, and you know even down in North Carolina and everything has so much of of the rhododendron and just rhododendron is so big and so thick. You know, we have mountain laurel where I, where I'm at. We do have some rhododendron in spots, but from what I've seen uh, down down your way like it's it's crazy how it's almost like its own forest of of rhododendron (laughs) and it's just nasty it's it's like that that's that's a place where uh you need to be using your maps when you're navigating using spartan forge and going through because even (laughs) then you know that gps is only so accurate if you're going if you have to go through it in the dark it can be difficult navigating through that stuff if you get off by 10 yards or so. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it, there's some places up here that is so thick and, and this is an exaggeration what I want to say, but it's what it feels like. It feels like you can walk 50 yards and your feet never touch the ground because you're walking on the limbs of the laurel. Uh, it, it can be miserable and it's definitely, the, you know, uh, some of these big bulky stands that we had in the past, you didn't go through that stuff with those. Yeah. Uh, you had to cut trails through it. And uh, so, yeah, it, uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's part of what uh, helps some of these big bucks uh, reach that, you know, the five, six, seven, eight year old range, you know, so. Yeah. Then that's, and that's why, that's why we, we like having you uh, testing stuff for Timber Ninja as far yeah. as like, <laughs> all right, like, well, how can we, we need to get it with a guy as far as needing something that's compact and can, yeah. you know, weave in and out through, through some of that stuff. Cause that's, yeah, like that's, that's something, you know, you try to go through there with a, uh, an old summit climber. Uh, it just, you're, you're done. <laughs> yeah. You're going, I've you, been there, done that, and I will not go back. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, that makes sense. The, the, so the, the other question I have, um, based on that spot with it being so thick like that throughout, was it, how, how do I want to word this? The, the places that you were finding him or that you were hunting him and stuff, were you finding, were you finding kind of some gaps in that that extremely thick stuff? Is that how you yeah. were looking at that? Yeah, that there was areas that it thinned out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you you would have, you know, I don't know, you, you would have a hillside or something other that uh, might have a one hundred yard by one hundred yard opening, or uh, and some smaller than that, and 
that that's the kind of places that I was uh, hanging my cameras and I was hunting around the edges of those spots too, because I could get in and out of those type of spots without the, uh, you know, disturbing the area very much. Once you start going through that rhododendron and mountain laurel, you know, uh, you're touching everything and, uh, and you're spreading a lot of scent. Uh, so you got to be really careful, especially during, you know, bow season about doing that, you know. Yeah. I don't worry as much about it uh, once they uh, start getting with does and stuff, uh, because you you need to get into that thick stuff then to to hunt them and and expect to have an encounter with them. But um, yeah, it, it uh, you know that they was some openings that uh, that I bow hunted bow hunted him some. So, but yeah, I tell you that these older age class bucks they just man they just don't like to come out in those open type places. Uh, during the daylight that that much so you you don't see them in those well you know this the 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 deer that i was hunting this year i got eyes on him october 31st and and he did exactly what these every older age class buck i've ever hunted or ever seen in the woods even during you know even during starting getting in some rutting type behavior is they don't come, you know, even on the edges, they don't just walk on the edge in the open. Mm -hmm. It's like they tuck into, you know, and for us, yes. we have a lot of beach brush that gets extremely thick and almost is like a, you know, mountain laurel or rhododendron yes. thicket of beach brush. And it was like, mm -hmm. all I could see was his tines going through that. And it's like, I can't even, I can't even find a spot to bow hunt and have, you know, unless I were to go in there and cut it you know, which I'm not able to do. And then even if I could, it's like, they still find a way to, to be able to navigate that. It's like, yep. they're so intelligent with in the lot, the last day I was hunting bow hunting this year in PA, I, I was like, all right, I, I got to get into this, this beach brush. And so I found like, there was a little logging road that cut through it. And I was kind of on the edge of, of the, the newer logging cut and the beach brush, but I had some pockets that I could shoot into it and rate it, rate it dark. I mean, it was just at last light. I could hear a deer coming and he's coming through the beach brush and he gets right to that logging road and he stopped and didn't move for, I don't know how many minutes it felt like 10 minutes, but it was probably more like three or four minutes. And, you know, at that point it was getting dark and I could, all I could see was kind of like somewhat of a shadow but i couldn't tell if i was making it up in my head you know when you get that real gray light scenario about 100 yards from me and then eventually came out on that open logging road walked about 60 yards and then cut right back into the beach brush and he was only i don't know 15 yards from me at that point but it was too dark to, to yeah. even real i don't even know what he was but it just acted like you know what a mature buck would do versus that I was just watching the, you know, the young seven point that went right through the open, you know, off to the side of the the trail. And it's, it makes it so difficult to, to, yeah. uh, and that's, that's why they're so hard to, to be able to hunt and, and, and to be able to get in with what I do feel more confident, you know, with a gun, as far as kind of getting in some of that stuff, as far as, you know, putting a bullet through it a little bit more than I do. And then, than I do with, um, with a bow but yeah yeah it's just it's just interesting how they how they utilize that but I, I was just i was curious because you know that's those areas that's actually one of the questions that i've i've been asked uh or asked this to to talk about on the podcast quite a bit is areas that are extremely thick with laurel and and or rhododendron, you know, there's, there's places in PA that are way thicker with, with mountain laurel than where I'm at. And it's like, you'll get an entire hillside that's, that's, mm -hmm. you know, covered with it. It's like, you know, what, what do you do in, in that scenario? But from what I've found is similar to what you said, even those areas that are completely covered with it, you can find places that get a little bit thinner in, in spots yes. and then, you know, have those kind of gaps in there. Yeah. And, and if you want to have, uh, any chance at all of having an encounter with those uh, bucks, that's the type of places that you have to hunt, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and the problem with hunting those type of places is uh, you can't see very much. So you don't, you don't, uh, you see very little game, you know, but when you do see them generally, it's what you want to see, you know? Yeah. So, but I, something else I have noticed too, uh, or starting to learn is, uh, seems to me like that deer that live in, uh, really really thick type areas like that seem to be more shy 
than deer that live in more open type areas. Uh, because you getting daylight pictures of these deer is very, very difficult. And um, I mean, it, it, and it's so sporadic. And I believe that they just don't like to move that much until it's dark. And uh, and the reason I say that is because I've hunted other places that uh, uh, like West Virginia, for example, that, you know, that most of the places over there, you don't have near the cover there, mm -hmm. but you will see uh, a lot of daylight activity, you know. Yep. And uh, I just feel like that deer that live in more open type areas feel more comfortable moving around in uh, daylight, you know. And maybe it's because they can see better, you know. I don't know, but uh, I don't know. That's that's something that I'm, you know, paying a little bit more attention to and uh, figuring out. So, no, no, it's it it's it's funny hearing you say that. You know, you're saying what 42 or 43 seasons that you have under your yeah. belt at this point, and still learning and and continually oh, yeah. just yeah, it's it's crazy to me. And you know, it's yeah. these it's these seasons that. You know, I mean, you've you've hunted quite a bit up until this point, and not all not all on this specific deer, but hunted a lot in these these seasons that tend to go on longer. You know, like the one I'm in currently, I feel like you learn so much from those seasons versus the ones that it all comes together in a couple sets. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. You you have to be constantly learning because trust me, nobody has it figured out. No, nobody does. And uh, things are different from area to area, uh, area. but uh, yeah, if you're not constantly learning, uh, then you're just going to be stagnant, and your hunting's going to be stagnant. Um, so that you just got to keep going forward and, and learning about these animals. And um, man, they're just so fascinating, anyway. You know. Yeah, and 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 the thing that that one one of the other things I think is so impressive about seeing that rack, you know, a hundred what one hundred seventy inches a bone mm -hmm. is what what yeah. you gross them at like seeing that and hearing that number is one thing but understanding what it goes into doing that and you know and in virginia uh or pennsylvania either you know those types of places to to see that and you know there there, there are guys out there that will get trail camera pictures of a buck of that caliber at some point or even you know even 140 150 inches and it's like then the to actually kill one is a whole nother story you know yes. i you know and not that that i've have a pile of trail camera pictures of giant deer all over the place that don't but i've i've been lucky enough to find a decent amount of really big deer or what i consider really big deer and not you know almost all of them were not killed by me you know that that's it's it's such a hard thing to be able to do and to be able to get on and focus on a deer in the places like the mountains like this it's just to me i i just when i saw that that you you got that deer i was just like that that that's something extremely special well what to to, to kind of uh to for the audience here to uh, as a comparison you know the area that i hunted this deer you know I, i've hunted it quite a bit this year and uh including him now i seen him one time which is the time that i killed him but uh I, i've seen less than 10 deer from the the beginning of season up until the time that i killed him and our season opens first of october uh, and i went to iowa and i saw and I, i'm i'm well, I, I saw more bucks in, um, I seen more bucks in a week and a half of hunting in Iowa than I would in 15 years of hunting here in the mountains of Virginia. Uh, that is, that's the difference. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh yeah, that is, that is definitely a difference. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's crazy. Uh, the, the difference, uh, you know, so. And I'm not speaking how easy it is out there because, you know, mature deer are never easy anywhere. But just to give you a uh, a picture of how it is here in the Appalachian Mountains, you know, uh, the hunting is tough. Um, we do grow some, you know, pretty nice deer, uh, but uh, 
Yeah, you, you just, you, you know, so some years are better than others, too. You know, you, you'll see a few bucks, and then some years it's like you can't even buy a two-and-a-half-year-old, you know, yeah. and, and see, so. <laughs> yeah, no, it, that's, it, it, that's, that's, that's... That's mountain whitetails for you. Oh, yeah, yeah, and it's it's so true, and, and the fact that, you know, someone like you that has been doing it for so long and, and put so much time into it, that still struggles, you know, almost yes. every year, not, you know, some years you go better than others, but, and that's not just you and all of us that put in all this time, it's not easy. And it, you got to mm-hmm. love doing that. Like, you know, there's, yes. you know, you, you look at the, the deer that you shot like, wow, Virginia can grow some giants, but it's like, yeah, anywhere really can, but it's just like the you, you got to be dedicated to do it, and and you know even for someone like myself that at this point you know my a lot of my job is surrounded by hunting, and I get to hunt a lot more than than most people do. But even with that being said, you don't see me like traveling around, you know, bouncing a week in this state, week in that state, week in if, if I want to be successful in Pennsylvania or anything, like I gotta put a lot of time and effort into it and and you know this is the same scenario with with what you have there in in virginia and and why don't you grab that buck and hold it up to the camera so if anybody's watching the video one can can see that (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah he said this point here is a little over 13 inches and uh this one here is almost 13 and of course these his G3s are both over 10 inches. Uh, his main beams are right around 26, and uh, he's got uh, almost 38 inches of mass. Oh. So for a, a, a Virginia whitetail, um, they, they just don't get much better than that. No. And, and j- just the way his main beams uh, curve in toward each other, he, he's just a beautiful deer, and which is why I named him Dreamcatcher because I couldn't have uh, – drawn up a more perfect buck uh you know that that he's the buck of my dreams so yeah oh man that's and and you know you're talking about that but at the same in the same respect i mean you're you're no stranger to hunting big deer and one thing that i learned and i didn't necessarily know about you at the beginning when i met you but that you had the the west virginia state record for a while well i I I killed the number two number two in okay. the state for for the 2006 season. Okay, gotcha. Yes, yep, gotcha. Yep. Well, and and he was a buck that I was hunting on purpose too. I killed him. Uh, it was going to be him or nothing that year, and I actually killed him on the, my fifth sit for him. Oh man! And and how big how big was that deer? He grossed 184. <laughs> yeah, that's. That is absolutely crazy, and 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 so that was in in two thousand six. And so you, have yes. you was that was that deer kind of where you started like wanting to target specific deer? Or did that start before that? No, it started before then, and and I killed some. You know, I've killed you know bucks before that, uh, but that was that that was the first truly really big deer that I've killed. You know, and uh, and since then I've always tried. And it's kind of funny because, you know, I, I everybody knows that I hunt Ohio some, and Ohio is a, is a big buck state. Uh, Virginia isn't, but I actually hold myself to higher standards uh, here in the mountains of Virginia than I do anywhere else I, I've hunted. And, um, and, it, and it's not known for being a big buck state, but I, I, I've had a goal of a 150 plus and i've tried to uh you know stick close to that so yeah. and that that means i've went a lot of seasons without killing anything here in virginia too you know but uh that's, that's tough. the way i like it that's that's <laughs> tough that's tough to do i and i you know i i've i've been trying i don't know if, if you want to call it maturing as a deer hunter or what but i've been trying to do that in pennsylvania and it's, it's, it's hard. Like, cause I do, yeah. I do like shooting bucks and I am happy with, with smaller deer when it comes to it. But I also know that if I want to shoot really big deer, I can't shoot 
smaller deer and that's i i i I juggle this all the time in my in my own i guess my own thought process and where i want to be and like how i want my season to go but the one thing i do enjoy about holding out a little bit more is just like getting to see the season you know i used to look at when I had a tag, tag still in my pocket coming to gun season, I looked at that as I was a failure. Like that was just like, I like, man, I am, I must be doing bad because I didn't fill my tag. And, and yeah. I, I look at it a little bit differently now. And it's still like, I, I, I always like to want to do it during archery season. And there's nothing. And I, and I, I've come to like gun hunting. I used to not yeah. like it. And I think I just looked at it through the wrong lens of, you know, I was just, oh, there's pressures, people, all this stuff. But, you know, I think, yeah, you and I were talking about it. I like the fact that during gun season now, too, like, I'll, I'll go to some some new areas on occasion and just, like, almost like I'm scouting with my gun and still yeah. hunting and getting and kind of taking that pressure off of just having to sit in a tree or having to to focus on this one deer and, and getting out and 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 having fun with it. I mean, in 2020, when I shot my biggest buck, that was when Johnny and and me and Johnny were sitting at camp the night before. And we're like, why don't we just, you know, go hunt together and have fun and just, you know, take, we were both hunting different areas and deer and we went out together and had fun with it. And, you know, I ended up shooting, you know, my biggest deer that happened to be one that Johnny had on camera. So I feel bad for him at that point. I still haven't (laughs) haven't repaid that favor hundred percent yet, but, uh, it, it, uh, I I don't know. I guess the, the whole moral of that story was like, I, I don't look at it as much of a, as a failure as I just keep getting to have these more experiences and, and, and get to learn so much more. And like I'm learning cause I haven't hunted as much during gun season as I have during archery seasons over the years. And the more I've, I've been able to do it, you know, I always just thought the gun season was just like, all right, all these deer are just running wild because there's people <laughs> everywhere. And I'm learning there's, there are still patterns, so to speak, or they're, they're doing things as deer are. There's not people in, behind every tree and you know i was just sending you a picture i think i sent you a picture yesterday of a deer that uh you know showed up on my camera in in a spot when i decided to try to take care of other things and not and not hunt and it was like that deer wasn't being pushed around he was he was following a doe and coming through this you know this this area and just it just made me rethink all of it and i'm i'm learning more and more as uh as i start to do that and honestly leaving trail cameras out all year has helped me learn a lot too as far as like where they tend to be during these gun seasons and where they tend to be once it gets colder weather and everything yeah but yeah i don't know yeah you know uh kind of changed the subject a little bit there you know i i've I've kind of reached the goal now and um i kind of see myself going the opposite way now um i'm going to try to do without trail cameras and because trail cameras cause me anyway a lot of stress because whenever you're hunting top tier bucks and you successfully find those top tier bucks then uh, your your whole world revolves around those and um and and you worry about who else might be hunting him is he still alive because he hasn't been on your camera for a month and um you know all of a sudden somebody else finds out about him and and so you're worrying about them hunting how how their uh you know their pressure is going to change your hunt for him and and you know maybe he's already dead and, and you're hunting something that's no longer there you know and i'm i'm ready to be over that stress uh so <laughs> i'm i'm going to try to go the uh non-camera route uh i killed him before trail cameras and i can still do it you know now but uh and i'm i'm going to i'm getting to the point that um i'm not as going to be as worried about hunting specific deer and because I, to be honest with you uh, it's taken a lot of the fun out of it for me in the past and uh, I, I want to put that fun back into it and so I, i'm gonna 
I'm, I'm just going to hunt normal, normal bucks now. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that kind of sounds probably strange. You know, uh, I've been so hardcore about hunting very specific bucks in the past up until this point, but I, I kind of feel like that I've reached a, uh, uh, a milestone or a, a peak, or I, I don't know how to explain it, but, uh, it's almost like a, a load has been lifted off my shoulders and I can relax now. And, uh, as strange as that may seem, you know, now I tell you all this, but now I guarantee you come, come fall, I'll, I will have another big deer that I'm after, but, uh, I don't know. I'm just trying to tone that stuff down. You know, I'm getting yeah. a little bit older now. And so I think that it's time for me to kind of start doing that. No, I think that's, I think that's really cool. And, and, you know, I was just actually, my dad and I were just talking about that with cameras and all of a sudden you start, you start getting so many cameras too. And it becomes a job of just checking them and worrying. And it's like, okay, you know, I don't have anything in this area on camera that i have in this area you know so you don't hunt this spot which you know you know especially during the rut anything can really happen or show up in the in these woods and it kind of yeah it kind of throws things around a little bit and even johnny was saying that too about he's like i just kind of want to get away from from using these cameras and I, i think i think you hit a good point where you hit that that goal and and kind of hit it out of the the park to where yeah go do that and if you decide you, you know, it's not like any decision that you make has to be forever you may decide hey maybe i want to have that stress again it's like one of the you know that type yeah. two fun of of wanting to do that again and you can do that yeah and and the way that i look at it is um now i'm not against trail cameras trail cameras are a fantastic tool especially whenever used correctly it's fun to get pictures of these deer but in a way they take away some of the adventure aspect of it and also whenever i'm getting pictures of uh you know a top five percent deer i'm kind of tied to that area and i don't feel you know i feel like that i have to hunt him whereas if i don't know exactly what the deer looks like I'm a lot more likely to go other places and, and hunt those areas, you know? So, and that puts more adventure back into it. And really and truly that's, that's kind of the part that I'm looking for now, you know, is just putting that adventure back into it, uh, enjoying the mystery of things. So. Yeah. And I know like you, you like to, I, we've talked about it in the past, but you like to backpack hunt sometimes, you know, it's yes. like, Maybe you just want to, you find an area on a map that just looks cool and you want to just go there and and yep. see it. It's like, okay, I'm not tied because I'm so worried about this deer that's living over yep. here. Maybe I just want to go back in and, and maybe you don't see a single deer and, you know, in three days back in there, but at least you get to go see it and, and check that's it out. Exactly right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Like I, I, man, I, I can, I can relate to that where the, the, the deer I was hunting this year was in an area that I just, I don't like hunting. It's just, yep. it's, it's flat and it's just like, it's, I just hate, I just hate it. And, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. there's some areas I look at, I'm like, man, I love, like, I like this. Like, it seems like I just want to hunt that area, but it's not, yep. doesn't have what this area has got, you know? And, and yep. I, I can totally, totally see that as being, yep. you know, putting that, putting that fun back into it for you. So I, I'm, I'm pumped that you're, you're going that route. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And see that opens up, uh, ch- you know, I get a lot of invites uh, out of state and stuff. And it's just like Iowa this year. I was, who would ever be not excited about going to Iowa? Well, you know what? I wasn't excited about going to Iowa. It was because of this deer right here. Yeah. And, uh, and that's pretty sad whenever you're not excited to go to uh, the whitetail Mecca and uh, because you're worried about a deer that you got back home, you know, so. You know, I, I want to come up. Uh, I, I've been invited to Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Oklahoma. Uh, and so that I feel like that will free up, uh, the, you know, those, you know, the opportunities to go hunt those type of places, you know. Hey, you, so. you stay out of Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm not inviting you up here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I would love I would love to get you and Jason to come up here in gun season and just like experience our 
camp aspect and just like I think that'd be great. Yeah, yeah you know, absolutely. just take you know, just ma- make it fun and come up and 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 do that. I think that'd be that'd be really cool. That all joking aside, you're you're welcome up anytime. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and if and if I don't open the doors for you, you know Johnny will down the road, so that'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and of course you guys are welcome to come down here with me anytime. So yeah, no, I I do want to I do want to come down and hunt with you sometime during one of those gun seasons because they're just yeah. and you know our gun season just well just opened up here at the time of recording this you know after Thanksgiving it'd be cool to like try out a state where you can you know either hunt with a muzzleloader or rifle in in November a little bit earlier and just like I don't know that that would be that'd be really fun to do yep. that and try it yep yep well come on all right <laughs> I open him by that sounds good man well Nathan, I don't want to take any more of your time. I know you're on your four tens here, so I, I'll let you let you get back to it there. But I'm I'm glad you're willing to come on and share this story of of that deer because that's just that's magnificent and and I'm so happy for you, buddy, and that it uh, all worked out the way that it did. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I just feel really blessed to even been able to hunt uh, an animal like this, let alone kill him. You know, so I, to be honest with you, whenever I was, uh, I, I, even though I didn't kill him very deep, it was pretty rugged back in there where he was at. So I packed him out. And as I was coming out, I was kind of sad, uh, because I was taking him from his home, you know, and, uh, um, you know, everybody thinks that we're just out for blood and horns, you know, but, uh, that's not the case. You know, we, we really love these animals, even though we like to, you know, to take them home with us sometimes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that that's the end goal but uh uh there's much more to it than that so yeah and and i i do want to add to that something i was thinking about while i was sitting there up against a tree today and i was like you know if if it were all for you know just the one deer of you know taking home if, if that, that was the only reason i did it now obviously it's a big motivating factor but would I, you know, just spent, you know, a couple hundred miles in the spring scouting around and, and running cameras during the summer and, and spending this time in the tree and, and just sitting dark to dark and then, you know, moving. And like, I was just thinking about this whole season and how it's, and, you know, up until this point, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't killed anything with a bow or a gun in PA. And it's just like, it's, it was kind of wild to think about. And, and it's like, I, I love, I love deer. I love these, you know, the big mature deer, but I also love the does and watching them and yeah. seeing, like just seeing them live in the landscape and, and move yeah. through it. So it's, it's, it's a, we're pretty, uh, we're pretty blessed to be able to, to do that. And yeah, no, I just, uh, I don't really have any more to say than that, but <laughs> <laughs> Well, and so since since you uh, since you do have your Instagram activated at the moment, do you want to give everybody a place where they can follow you along? <laughs> you seen that, didn't you? I, yeah. Well, I went to actually. I went. Jason texted me when you when you shot that deer, and uh, and I was just like, "Huh." I wonder. I said, "I wonder if he he posted a picture of it yet before I texted you," and uh, and then. I, I went on there. I'm like, I can't even find his name. And Jason's like, Oh, he de- he de- he, de- he deactivated that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do that sometimes. I tell you, I get so, and and I know that you probably do too. Yeah. And and for everybody out there listening, you know, uh, we get overwhelmed sometimes with messages and and trying to juggle those and hunt and family time and work time this time of year it can be really difficult and it, and it bothers me to see messages in my inbox that I haven't even opened for several days, you know, but I, I always try to get to every single one of them. So, you know, people just need to be uh, kind of uh, mindful of that, you know, but uh, th- that's the reason that I did. I was just getting stressed uh, <laughs> over all that and, and, um, and I just needed a little bit of a break from it. And I do that from time to time. So yeah. I had I had friends that was uh, messaging me, asking me if I unfriended them. <laughs> no, I didn't unfriend them. I don't unfriend 
Well, anyways, what what is your uh, Instagram handle for everyone? Uh, Mountain Hunter, M T N H U N T R. Cool. So, uh, yeah, but that's that's where you can find me. So, yeah, and you can see those beautiful pictures with the rhododendron and, and that buck, and you and your dad, and and everything there. And I'll, I'll and then obviously, if you if you were watching the video version, you got to see the 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 rack here on on camera so thanks for sharing that with us Nathan. Yeah. man i really oh, appreciate i'm glad it. to be able to share it with you <laughs> <laughs> i know you are i i didn't know like when i asked you to come on here i didn't know whether you were gonna that you were gonna want to talk about it or just like i i didn't want to like bug you on it but i also wanted to uh, wanted to hear this story and and get everyone else to to be able to hear it because dreams are real and there's the proof that's right, <laughs> that's right. That, that they do come true some, sometimes so <laughs> all right man well you have a good rest of your night and we'll talk to you later all right thanks bo thanks so much for listening to this episode of east meets west hunt with your host bo martonic for more great content and to stay up to date visit east meets west hunt.com facebook at east meets west outdoors and instagram at east meets west hunt if you enjoyed today's episode please review and subscribe and we'll catch